Good day, Leroy. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Oh, you're welcome, Guy. Uh, more, more than happy to do it. Uh, I'm excited to have this discussion. Very cool. Thank you. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you grew up? And um, I understand that uh, after high school, you went off into the Coast Guard. Can you can you tell us about where this all started for you? Okay. Uh, actually, most people can probably tell from my accent. I grew up in the South. I lived in Montgomery, Alabama until I was 14 and moved down to just outside of Tampa, Florida. Uh, when I graduated high school, I actually had a, a scholarship at the University of South Florida and decided uh, not to do that. I, I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with myself when I grew up, but I, I did want to um, get a little bit of experience. I was considering uh, marine biology, and I talked to the Coast Guard recruiter, and they had a rating called Marine Science Technicians that did meteorological and oceanographic stuff. And I said, hmm, that sounds good. So. Uh, I enlisted in the Coast Guard specifically to become a marine science technician. I figured I could get some experience, and four years later, I could get out. I'd have the GI Bill, and if I really wanted to do the marine biology thing, I, I, I could. Turns out, I had a great time in the Coast Guard, and I decided to re-enlist. And uh, 22 years later, I retired from the Coast Guard as an E-9, a Master Chief. I could have stayed in a lot longer, but I wanted to get started on a second career before age became a bigger barrier than what it is in the civilian world. Mm -hmm. So, um, my 10 of my last 12 years in the Coast Guard, I was at the Coast Guard Training Center in Yorktown, Virginia. I originally went there as an instructor to introduce computer stuff into the curriculum, and I became the senior instructor, and then I took over the school. I was the school chief. And uh, one thing that's different in the Coast Guard than probably a lot of civilian organizations is jobs and job tasks are very well defined. They're job performance requirements for, for pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. If there's some new piece of equipment or, or some new job task that uh, becomes available, there's a job task analysis and then there's job performance uh, requirements and qualifications that are established for that. So uh, I really enjoy what the Coast Guard does in, in their training because they have to be lean because the organization is so small. Altogether, there's less than 40,000 active duty officers and enlisted in the Coast Guard. New York City's got a bigger police department than the entire Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. So with an organization that small, you can't afford to have somebody not on the job sitting in a classroom for extended periods of time covering nice to know things as opposed to need to know things. And it's performance-based uh, because the whole point of training in the Coast Guard is to improve someone's ability to perform a function. So, yes, you don't find that uh, rigor in the civilian world. Um, the consequences are much different, of course, and so that's probably yeah. what, what drives a lot of that. Um, so what during your time in the Coast Guard, you spent time doing ISD, Instructional System Design type work. Uh, what are some of the more interesting projects that you worked on as an isd -er? In the Coast Guard, and then uh, I've got a, another one from after I left the Coast Guard when I was at Apple. But in the Coast Guard, the, the school that I, I taught or that I ran, the Marine Science Technician School, uh, marine science technicians over time evolved to where they were doing a lot more than just meteorological and oceanographic stuff, primarily because the Coast Guard quit doing most meteorological and oceanographic things except for on icebreakers. Uh, the marine science technicians are stationed primarily in marine safety offices where they deal with uh, has hazardous chemical releases, oil spill response, that kind of stuff, but also boarding vessels, inspecting facilities, checking for safety of life at sea, um, you know, regulation uh, requirements. So our class A school, people went through that. They got the meteorological and, and limited oceanographic stuff. It was, you know, a good science background. Then when they, they graduated from that, they went on to uh, what's called a class C school where they got more specialized training if they were going to a marine safety office or if they were going to uh, uh, an icebreaker uh, they, they could they could go directly on to, to the ship and not have to go through the marine safety training until they were getting ready to have to use it on the job. 
Um, we did create, while I was there, a six-week-long uh, advanced weather briefer course for the, the Coast Guard men and women that were on the icebreakers. There were forecaster billets where they would be the person that would have to brief the, the, the captain on you know, what, what was going on. Um, there's a joint service forecaster course that's currently at, at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi, but it's a seven and a half month long course. Mm. So it starts with the general fundamentals of meteorology, which we covered already in our, our class A school. And uh, it's designed and, and developed for a more diverse uh, audience and kind of a, a kind way of saying maybe people who aren't quite as intelligent this is the students that we had because they had to have a very, it was the toughest school for someone to get into in the Coast Guard as far as their ASVAP, the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test Scores. Mm -hmm. So we can move along really quick, uh, but we developed a six week long course that, that basically covered all the material that was in that seven week or a seven month course, uh, the Joint Services Forecaster course to make it to where the Coast Guard, they could send somebody the permanent change of station orders to go to this joint service school for seven months, or they could send them to, to me and my school for six weeks and basically get the, the equivalent end result out of the student. So it was a save, saving time and time's money and, and getting people back out in the field doing their job quicker kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, my Apple experience, I was the senior manager of technical training for Apple's global training organization. I'd worked as a systems engineer, senior systems engineer, supporting education in the field for six years. And then I moved into the, the training management position. And I designed and developed and implemented a, a, a certification course, a series of certification courses for people that were uh, wanted to, to be a qualified system administrator whether they're managing servers or dealing with network stuff. So we had to start with a, you know, a job task analysis and doing a training needs analysis and, and totally define in a perfect world what are all the things that a fully qualified system administrator needs to be able to do. And I had the, had the luxury of being able to, to do it right. You know, I convinced my chain of command, here's what has to happen. I can't just give you a course tomorrow that's two days long. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. I can be until we've clearly defined it and got to do that. So it was, that was rewarding. Very cool. So was your Apple uh, experience right after you got out of the Coast Guard? Uh, no, I actually had uh, for, for two years, uh, I went to Christopher Newport University uh, to, to complete an information science degree. Uh, I was close to a master's degree in meteorology, and I, I seriously considered pursuing that, although there are not too many uh, universities that, that actually have doctorate degrees in meteorology. And then this was before you had the, the AccuWeather and, and all the broadcast meteorologists paid money to get all their stuff from, from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And the only jobs that would be available to me be available to me with a PhD in meteorology then because I got out of the Coast Guard in 96 would have been either working for the federal government or academia and I decided well if I get a computer science or information science degree I'll be pretty much instantly employable anywhere in the developed world so that's what I did and that's what led you to Apple after that yes I, I got I, I worked um, for Computer Sciences Corporation for a little over a year, I was hired to be a system administrator on their Macintosh team at NASA Langley Research Center. Uh, they had three different uh, teams of, of sysadmins for Mac, for Windows, and for Linux and uh, Unix um, mm -hmm. machines. And then I took over as the, the team lead, the guy that used to be the team lead. He just wanted to go out and fix stuff that was broken, didn't want to have to deal with meetings and planning and politics and that kind of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> that got me uh, in close contact with the Apple account executive and the systems engineer that supported NASA. And that led to a job offer uh, working as SE in Virginia. And I was there for a couple of years. 
And the whole time I was in the Coast Guard, I was a legal resident of Florida. When I retired and stayed in Virginia, I had to change my legal domicile. And all of a sudden, when I became a Virginia citizen, I learned about this thing called state income tax and personal property tax. <laughs> so I, actually, Apple offered me a, a good relocation package to come back to Florida where I could change, change my, my uh, legally quit having to pay state income tax. Exactly. And uh, so I've been back in Florida since June of 2000. So what are you doing nowadays? <laughs> uh, I'm the president of a nonprofit that supports a nearby state park. And uh, all, all the people on the on the board of directors, we, we don't get paid anything. But what, what we do, our, our mission statement is to um, preserve, protect, and support Alify River State Park and presenting resource-based recreational opportunities to the public. We've got 25 miles of equestrian tra trails, 20 miles of mountain bike trails from beginner, intermediate, uh, advanced and, and expert level. This is an old phosphate mine that, that's no longer mined, so there are some serious up and downs. But it hasn't been mined since the early 60s, so no, now there's old growth trees there, you know, big, gigantic live oaks. You, you would never know that it was a mine until you get back into it. Mm -hmm. We also have hiking trails, so I spend a good bit of my time outdoors maintaining trails and occasionally getting to enjoy them uh, riding my bicycle mm -hmm. or hiking. Mm -hmm. Let me take you back a little bit uh, again to your time in the Navy when you were involved with uh, Coast Guard. Oh, excuse me, Coast Guard. <laughs> That's the, all right. the Navy was me. Excuse me. Um, but uh, so your time in the Coast Guard, where you were involved with TQM, Total Quality Management. Tell us a little bit about uh, what the Coast Guard uh, did with uh, TQM. Well, we had uh, Commandant, the, the Admiral in charge of the Coast Guard. In the early 90s, uh, he, he, he actually wanted to win a Malcolm Baldridge Award uh, before they decided what they were going to do with that for, for government, federal agencies and stuff. Uh, he, he, was, he was a big fan of, of, of Deming and thoroughly believed that the people in a better position to fix some process that's messed up are the people that are doing the work not some bean counter so far removed, they don't have a clue what the job entails. So that was that was pushed down to larger headquarters units to try and implement some quality action teams and, and, and see, see if it could really make things better. Uh, because the Coast Guards did such a good job of analysis, we had all kinds of data. You could figure out what is the choke point in the process and real easily you could change just that and then measure again. If it's better, look for the next low-hanging fruit and, and, and move on. But the people who could figure out what is the choke point isn't somebody at headquarters. It's somebody right there dealing with, what do you mean? There's one person who can do this and 15 people feeding stuff in and getting stuck in the queue? You know, give us two or three more of that one person and, and the problem solved. So I got involved. Um, I was at the Coast Guard Training Center in Yorktown, which had a, a staff of about 600 uh, military people and probably 100 civilians that were educational specialists that, that were involved in the training development process. And uh, got involved as a, a, a TQM facilitator. And then I went around and, and helped some other quality action teams get established. And I, I would be the facilitator in, in their, their meetings. And also chaired a few that were uh, cross-command Coast Guard training. They had more than one training center. Elizabeth City, North Carolina is where they did their aviation stuff. And they had some in Petaluma, California, where they had electronics technicians and, and culinary specialists and some other things. But I, I was in charge of some quality action teams where we tried to come up with some uniform ways of doing things. And the... the, the my favorite one that I worked on was to come up with leadership training for the E3s that were going to class A schools who would, if they passed the course and they had enough time in the, in the E3 pay grade, they would come out a third class petty officer in the E4. Uh, why it was significant in the Coast Guard going from E3 to E4 is the delegation of authority for law enforcement that goes from the secretary of, at the time it was the Department of Transportation, now it's Homeland Security, 
goes to the commandant and it goes right on down the chain of command, but it can't go below the E4 level. So to be a, a, a boarding officer where you, where you have a weapon, you're in charge of, of a team to, to go on uh, to do a boarding, whether it's fisheries or, or immigration or, or, or drug enforcement. <clears throat> All of the school chiefs, like I was, I was the chief of the Marine Science Technician School, the MST school. It was up to me to decide if somebody successfully completed the course, did they display proper petty officer potential where they should also be advanced? And, but there were no standardized rules for that between different schools and between the different training commands. So we did come up with some standardized, uh, we did term form objectives, skill and knowledge objectives for petty officer potential, just leadership at, at the, at the lower level. And, um, there were leadership schools available, but not for E3s to go to. Hmm. They're, they're, they're too junior. Uh, the, the leadership kicks in after somebody's on a second enlistment, you know, if they're E5, E6, and for officers, uh, they, they had their uh, a junior officer leadership management course, but there was nothing for the junior enlisted people. Thank you. But I got, I got to make it happen. That was cool. Very cool. Thank you. Let me shift gears a little bit here. And uh, this series of videos is entitled uh, nowadays the HPT videos. So HPT, Human Performance Technology, or Evidence-Based Practices for Performance Improvement, or HPI, Human Performance Improvement, various names that this is all known as. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to that? Where was that? Was that back in the Navy? And, uh, well, Coast Guard. Uh, Coast it, it Guard. Was actually, <laughs> it, it was actually at, uh, at boot camp at Cape May, New Jersey you know, when I went there. Mm -hmm. And because before uh, any class where we were going to be taught something, if it was just knowledge that they were trying to impart, Coast Guard history or customs and courtesies, that kind of stuff, they didn't go over the objectives, but if, if there was some physical thing we were going to be taught how to do, they clearly defined up front, here's what we expect you to be able to do at the end of this block of instruction. And if you don't get it, well, you're going to come back over here tonight and you're going to keep doing it until you do get it. Or if you can't, you're going to get bounced out. That's how it works here. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I understand the rules. Uh, then when I got at the Marine Science Technician School when I went there as an E3 uh, to become a, a third class Marine Science Technician, I experienced it again, but e even more so because I'd been in the Coast Guard for a couple of years. I knew this is what I wanted to do, and I was impressed with, with how they structured the schedule and how things were done. Uh, and then when I went back there as a staff member, then I really got into it. I, I think the Coast Guard's um, curriculum development process, I, I tell people who have never been in the military, I think of it as like Addy on steroids. Uh, the, the analysis, that has been done. Uh, and to get into the design, and I'll, I'll talk more about what I mean by design in a little bit when, when you ask me, but you have the data, you know the job is clearly defined, so it's easy to come up with terminal performance objectives and enabling objectives. And with an enabling objective, there's two types to me. There's knowledge and there's skills. So, and a, a job is not truck driver. A, a job in the Coast Guard's ISD methodology would be back the truck up to the dock. Mm -hmm. That that. It's something that has a definite beginning, a definite end, and it doesn't necessarily have to all be done by one person. Mm -hmm. There are different tasks that, that make up that job, um, and you can have more than one, one person involved in tasks that have to either be done sequentially or in parallel for things to work. But we had all the data that we needed to, to figure out the best way to do a, a curriculum outline, but no development started until after there was a, a very detailed curriculum outline that had been reviewed and approved. And part of that was the instructor student contact factors that would tell you for a class size of 10 people, 
how many instructors do you need? Mm -hmm. And if you can have five of these classes a year, it's, it's math to figure out the staffing levels for the schools. Nobody would ever come and say, we need you to add a day to cover this. It doesn't work that way. We need you to cover this. Tell us how much longer the course is going to be if we make an adjustment to it. Mm -hmm. And they would let the, the, the design development implementation staff, we determine course lengths, not some bean counter headquarters. Right. Very, very different. So uh, tell us a little bit more about then design uh, besides this outline. What, el what else? Uh, what, what, what's uh, a design uh, composed of? Well, to, to me and in, in, in the Coast Guard, anybody that, that works in training, they know that the design means writing the term performance objectives and the enabling objectives and then reviewing and validating those. I don't just sit down with blinders and say, I'm a subject matter expert. I know all this. You, you, you get true subject matter experts and program managers, people to look at it and say, yes, that thoroughly covers what we need, and then produce that detailed uh, curriculum outline document for staffing and, and figuring out, because at my school, we, we taught several courses, and if they decided they're going to increase the number of classes of one course, well, did it mean I needed another instructor? Did I need two more instructors? So we, all of that is done before development starts. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, with, with objectives, a, a final objective really has four parts. And this is something that in, the, in my exposure to uh, training experts in the civilian world, Everybody doesn't always write objectives that have four parts. To me, you need a condition, a, a performance using an agreed upon definition for a verb. Oftentimes there's confusion when you say list or describe or, or, or whatever. That needs to be part of your curriculum development process is what does a verb mean? So you need to condition the performance of reference and a criterion for, for a well developed objective and an example that I like to use when I when I was given talks about this is an example of a final term performance objective that has all four of those parts given a car with a flat tire a spare and a jack and a lug wrench that's the condition change the tire that's the performance in accordance with the owner's manual that's the reference with no errors that's the criterion so anybody who is literate they can read that and go, ooh, I know, I know what's expected. Mm -hmm. I know what I have to work with, and I can actually look it up, the reference, if, if I have questions about how to do it. Mm -hmm. So we, we tried to get all of our objectives like that. So if someone wasn't a subject matter expert in system administration or meteorology or in oceanography or, or hazardous chemical response, they could still read it. We had a reference. They could go pull that reference off the shelf and read about it. And in, in time, they could see that the enabling objectives that we listed, if somebody accomplished all those, they indeed could do that terminal performance. So that's, that's the ISD to me. When I hear, I know some people will probably be upset when, when they hear me say this. I hear people say they're an instructional designer, and I ask them, what do they do? They, they don't do design. You know, they're, they're, they're a graphics artist, or they're taking stuff in one format and pouring it in a template to convert in the format. You know, that's development. That's not design. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I hesitate to challenge somebody when they say they're an instructional designer and ask them what they do, and then they tell me that, and I go, okay, that's nice. Where do you work, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a job title that they're given, and it's not always uh, descriptive. Uh, it's often too broad, or it's narrowly focused in, in terms of what the job title describes, but the responsibilities are much broader. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's been a problem for a long time, and in the military, you guys have uh, figured a lot of this stuff out. So, But thank you for, for sharing uh, uh, some of that story. So... So who were some of your biggest influences? Now, what I'm hoping for is that we get some pointers to some people, some articles, some books that were impactful to you and your practices 
whether that's the ISD side of things or the TQM kinds of things. But uh, uh, what would you name as some of the more influential um, people or things? Well, early on in, in the training um, portion of my career in the Coast Guard, I, I did a, a, a Joe Harless job aids workshop. And it was like, oh, man, that's, that's good, good to have. And uh, while, while at Apple, I actually got to know uh, quite well both uh, Bob Mosier and Conrad uh, Stofferson. So Bob and Con mm -hmm. and their performance uh, support five moments in need workshops. Um, I think uh, job aids are, are really critical in any kind of a technical uh, training and what, what I did at Apple, I was a senior manager of technical training. I, I, I ran the Marine Science Technician School for the Coast Guard, so it was technical stuff. And some people, they tend to poo-poo job aids. But, you know, airline pilots with tens of thousands of hours, they have a checklist to, to go down just because if somebody pops their head in, in the cabin and asks a question, if they're mentally keeping track of where they are, they may skip a step. Or they may do something twice, and if it's a, a time-intensive process, they're wasting time. So uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in job aids to help someone until they actually master something, unless it's stuff that they do every day. I don't expect them to commit everything to memory, but to have something just to keep you straight. I, my wife and I, we go camping. We, we've got a, a travel trailer, and, and we actually have a little checklist to make sure before we leave the house do we have everything that, that we want to put in there? And, and when we get to a site, what's the procedure for setting things up? What do you need to do first? And uh, now we don't pull out a grease pencil and actually check it off, but we look at it. Mm -hmm. and, and we go, okay, did that, 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 okay, this is next. And, and after a while, you don't have to look at the checklist, but just knowing that you have it, if First time you go camping in a while, you, you pull it out and look at it and go, oh, yeah, good thing I looked at this or I'd have left that in the garage. <laughs> so Is, That's the truth. Uh, let me shift gears here. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you, I guess, what you used to do when you're doing instructional system design kind of work. So I normally set this question up by saying if you're at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor and they come up and say, Leroy, what do you, what do, you do? What's what's your uh, elevator speech example that you can share with us? Okay, well, back back when I was doing training, uh, I, I would say that I help improve the dust. That's my primary function. And uh, if somebody drilled down a little bit, then, then I Excellent. could get more more specific about what do I mean by that. No, no I'm talking improve their skill set so mm -hmm. they are more useful to their employee raise. But just giving somebody more money doesn't help them work better, unless motivation was the constraining factor. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that example. Uh, as a lifelong learner, uh, can you share with us what your current focus or next focus is for learning? <laughs> well, right, right now my focus is on building and maintaining trails. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get people who aren't allergic to work uh, so most of the training that I do now is, is dealing with resource management of, of physical resources in the park, how to build trails where the you've got good drainage, because I'm just outside of Tampa, Florida, and in the summertime we can get two hour, or two inches of rain in 15 minutes out of a thunderstorm. And some of our trails, if, if you don't have them set up to deal with the water right, well, it's, it's a mess. So most of the training I'm doing now is on on trail building and maintenance techniques with, with people that, that come out to the park and help us. So, Very cool. Thank you. Is there a uh, favorite? Uh, you're still involved on uh, social media. I see you on LinkedIn um, on occasion. So, are, so you're still active in all of this, but is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us because perhaps you, you feel you want to put your own spin on it. It's being misused or misconstrued. And uh, so this is your chance to help clean up our language. Okay. Well, 
I, I would say uh, a, a curriculum outline, and I, I show people an example of what I meant by that for the, the courses that I developed at, for Apple. Uh, with term performance objectives and enabling objectives, and then enabling objectives are, are, are listed the knowledge and the skill objectives where somebody could look at it and, and know what's involved in, in, in the whole course. So I think a curriculum outline is a very meaningful thing to have. If you are a, a training consultant like yourself, if you're trying to sell your business to some corporation, it's nice if you can give them some for examples of what you've done, but also show them behind the scenes, you know, the skeleton, how did you come up with this? So that's where curriculum outlines, to me, I think are important. It, it helps the developers know what to develop. It helps um, senior leaders know what's involved in the course that you're asking for some money to develop and, and take people off their jobs and send them to. And, and, and why? There, there should be some built-in ROI. You should be able to measure someone's skill before they attend a class. And two weeks after they leave the class, go measure it again. And there, there should be an improvement. If there isn't, you either got to, you have a defective training intervention or you have a defective employee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, it, it should be pretty easy to figure out which of those is, is the problem. So curriculum outline, I think that's. Excellent. Thank you for that example. Let's shift gears again a little bit here. Um, uh, I, what I'm looking for in this next section here are perhaps some stories of people who have influenced you. So you went to the Heartless uh, workshop. Maybe you have a story you can relate uh, to uh, share with us about uh, that, whether that was Joe or somebody. But what I'm looking for are, are people that are, can, they could be known in the field or really relatively unknown in the field, and you just want to do a shout-out and as acknowledgement of the influence that they've had on you. So if you were to share with us some stories of, of people who have influenced you, and uh, what can you share with us? Well, one of, one of the people that I think a book that he wrote and uh, a one-day seminar that he conducted that, that really it didn't so much help me personally, but it gave me some good ideas of how I could help others with Stephen Covey. And uh, I, I read, I read his, uh, you know, the seven, seven habits of highly effective people. And I had opportunity to go to a, a conference where he was speaking for, for a whole day, just about that. And the, the thing that I thought was the most important of all his seven habits is begin with the end in mind and how that relates to training. If, if, if you don't have job performance requirements, if nobody has defined what does success look like, you, you don't have much of a chance of, of designing, developing, implementing any kind of training intervention that's going to move the needle the direction you want it to. It's, it's like ready, ready, fire, aim. You, you, you've got to know what the end result is supposed to be before you start working or, or you're, you're wasting a lot of time. True. So. Um, Leroy, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to participate with me in this video interview. Um, as we wrap up here, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience? I'm, I'm looking for... Uh, guidance for people that are new to the field, whether they're younger or middle-aged or older, but uh, uh, for people coming into this field, what what's your recommendation? Uh, uh, what would you re uh, suggest to them? Well, <laughs> I'd say re read widely, social media and Skype. Uh, you, you can... You can interview people just like we're doing, um, but on LinkedIn, join some different groups that you don't have to physically be present. But if you if you do find uh, ISPI or, or some training organization that meets locally in, in your area, go to it. And, and at first, you can kind of be a wallflower. If, if you're scared that you don't know anything and you just want to absorb, be a sponge. But o over time, if you read and you talk to people and, and you're, 
you sincerely want to learn and you're inquisitive and you ask the right questions, pretty soon you're going to start building up your own expertise. Um, but the most important thing, I think, for, for anybody in any profession, seek out a mentor. Somebody who you look at them, you know that they know what they're doing, they're well respected, they're, they're, they're an honest person, they're, they're pleasant to be around, and ask them, say, can you help me become more like you? And being, being a mentor is almost as rewarding as being the mentee with an excellent mentor. It, it, it's, it's, it's fulfilling both ways. So seek, seek a, a mentor and uh, go for it. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you, Leroy, for sharing your wisdom and your insights with us on this uh, video interview, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Okay, thank you.